Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. It is Monday. Welcome to the first edition of Inside Arsenal of the Week. I hope you all had a good weekend and are feeling suitably refreshed as we head into another week. Lots to talk about as usual today. We've got an update on Durin Timber uh, with Arsenal having submitted that second bid according to Fabrizio Romano this morning. Um, building on from what I was saying over the weekend and how that was progressing and how the player himself was very excited about the potential move to Arsenal. We'll talk a little bit about Kai Havertz as that transfer gets closer to being completed. Uh, look at what Mikel Arteta has been having to say over the weekend. Emil Smith-Rose had a very good uh, weekend as well with the England under-21s. And of course, we'll end with some of your questions and comments. Right, let's get going, shall we? And let's start... Uh, with this man, Durian Timber. And as you can see there, Fabrizio Romano's tweet this morning on the Monday. I'm recording this at about 10.45 at the moment on Monday morning. So things might have progressed by the time you're watching this video. But that second bid we've been waiting for for Arsenal to submit uh, to Ajax following extensive talks between the two clubs that have progressed well in the last few days, as I said on the video I recorded on Saturday. Now, that second bid has gone in according to Fabrizio. It says they're between 45 and 48 million euros, which is certainly a lot closer to what Ajax are hoping for for Timber. Now, personal terms are not going to be an issue with Timber. We know that, as I said at the weekend, according to someone who uh, is pretty close to him that I know, um, you know, he's very, very excited about the prospect of moving to Arsenal. For him at the moment, it is all about Arsenal. He wants this deal to get done. Uh, Arsenal want it to get done. And Ajax are open for it to be done. And so these talks between the two clubs have been progressing well. And now, hopefully, this bid uh, that Romano um, talks about that has gone in, hopefully that is one that Ajax are willing to accept. And this deal can get over the line and everyone can, uh, can move on and be pretty happy because everyone wants it to get done. Uh, it's just a case of being able to agree a fee on that. Now, Timber certainly fits a lot of the profile that Arsenal want when it comes to a new signing. As I've spoken about in the past, his age is right slap bang in that age range that Arsenal really, really like with their players. Uh, he's very comfortable on the ball, good in possession, can bring the ball out. He's versatile, which again is so, so key to what Mikel Arteta wants when he looks for in players. So Arsenal will be very, very happy if they can get this done. You look at the sort of um, options that Mikel will have available to him should he arrive. And defensively, he's looking very good. He's got the two court type kind of lynch, linchpin in that defence in Saliba and in Gabriel. But then everyone around them can play in a multitude of positions. And that is what Mikel Arteta wants. He means he can rotate, he can move players in. He can, if someone gets injured in one role, he can move someone to play that role. Um, and it gives him an awful lot of options. So hopefully, fingers crossed, this one can get done. And, um, and Arsenal can sort of move on and focus on other targets in the window. They've got a lot of irons in the fire, which we'll get to, of course. Havertz, we know all about that one's as well. And then Declan Rice is going to be absolutely uh, key to this summer, shall we say, as we know. But, um, but yeah, for Arsenal, Durian Timber progressing and progressing pretty well by all accounts. And we'll wait to see what Ajax do with that bid. Plenty of you out there, I know, are probably a far more experts on this player than I am. I've spent a little bit of time sort of watching him and watching some of the videos, of course, since this news broke. I've spoken to a couple of people who have kind of been involved in his career um, in uh, the last few days, trying to get the lowdown on him. And uh, yeah, everything that I've heard seems good. There's been a couple of people I saw questioning him, potentially his ability in the air uh, and the physical side of things. Will he be able to compete? Um I mean, obviously, that's something that will, that will be borne out in the future. We'll see that. I remember when Ben White arrived, everyone questioned his ability in the air. I remember when Lissandro Martinez came from Ajax to Manchester United. Everyone was saying he was too small to handle the Premier League and physically be bullied. Well, he certainly hasn't been that. He was exceptional in that first season for Manchester United. So hopefully that won't be too much of an issue. But let me know what you guys think. All of you guys out there who certainly know a lot more about Timber than I do, let me know what you th guys think of him and the potential addition of him in the comments below and surely he will be joined by Kai Havertz if Timber signs are right. I'm, I'm pretty confident this one is going to get be getting done and as you can see Jorginho has been having a little bit of fun on social media in the last 24 hours when it comes to Kai Havertz a pair of them together at the moment and uh, yeah I think Jorginho certainly knows what he's doing <laughs> in that social media post that he posted up last night with the two of them. Uh, Havertz 
so a large part of his medical has been completed. I'm not sure if he's going to have to do another part of it over here. I don't know when he's coming over here, but uh, you know that is a, a deal that is virtually on the uh, on the verge of completion. And I think we just have to look at what Jorginho is doing there on his social media to know that fact that he knows it's coming. Kai Havertz certainly looks happy about it. Um, and yeah, quite a lot of you are happy about it. Quite a lot of you aren't. Um, but that is the way of the world in football, isn't it? Everyone's got different opinions on the player. And as I've spoken about in previous videos, I think my my approach to it is just going to be sort of sit back and see what happens uh, with him. Um, everyone's talking about his price tag, but no one will be talking about it, that price tag if he comes in and does well, just like no one talks about the price tag of Aaron Ramsdale on Ben White anymore. So, uh, But that deal is very, very close to being completed now. Certainly done a big part of his medical, if not all of it, did that abroad. I don't know if he comes after comes over here and sort of complete the final few touches of it over here um, and when that will all be announced. But yeah, I think we can all put a big tick next to Ty, Kai Havertz when it comes to him becoming a uh, an Arsenal player. One person who's not is this man. Ilkay Gundogan, obviously a player that Arsenal were interested in signing, did hold talks with, were you know, did want to get him on board. Mikel Arteta liked what he would have brought to the squad despite his age. Obviously, brilliant for Manchester City at the end of last season. Um, well, actually, the whole time he was at Manchester City, he was brilliant, but he played such a huge part in getting them over the line in that treble last season. But he has now gone and he's gone to Barcelona. It was always going to be the case. It always looked like Barcelona were the club he was going to go to. It made perfect sense to me. The fact, he wanted to try something new, move into Arsenal, another Premier League club, a team that's not as good as the club you're already at. Um, you know, it, it it just didn't feel like something uh, trying something new to me. Um, it always felt like Barcelona was the was the option he was going to end up going for, and that has now been the case, as you can see there, confirmed by Barcelona this morning. Two year deal for Gundogan with the option of a third. He was always looking for that three year contract, basically, and he's got it. Um, and you know, Barcelona have got themselves a fabulous player there. I think he would have been a really good signing for Arsenal. I know he's old or older than the normal type of signing Arsenal go for, but I think he would have brought real experience to the team, real leadership to the team. He's showed last season that he's you know, got a huge amount to offer still at the very highest level. Um, and I think with Granit Xhaka going, although it hasn't happened yet, but with Granit about to leave, I think Gundogan would have filled that sort of leadership void that Granit will leave behind and it would have been a good signing. But Barcelona got their man and they're very happy about it, as you can see there, um, announcing that transfer this morning. OK, right. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I'm sure some of you have, but I wanted to go over what I thought was a really interesting interview um, from Mikel Arteta. We haven't really heard too much from Mikel because he's been on holiday at the start of the week, uh, start of the summer. He really want, wants to use that time to get away and sort of reconnect with his family a little bit. He always does. His sister lives over in Mallorca. He loves going over there. Um, uh, but he's been speaking to Marca over in Spain recently. There's quite a few quotes we've been doing around in the last sort of 24 hours from it, if you haven't seen it already, um, from Mikel. And some of it was pretty interesting. He talked about the transfer window. He talked a lot about last season, how much it's going to always hurt. So I was a lead in Manchester City for so long. He talked about where he thought things had gone wrong, that sort of thing. Um, if you can't, haven't found it yet, then just search for it. Mikel Arteta Marca. It's a really good interview. Um but he had some interesting things to say about the transfer window and um, wouldn't talk about Declan Rice, as usual, did as usual. Uh, I don't want to talk about players that aren't Arsenal players. But he did say when talking about the window, he said, we already made a refresh of the squad. We're now together with owners to build a winning team that could be sustainable for the long term. We need important players and will attack the market to sign those who we need. I always think that Mikel does this in press conferences well. He uses interviews a lot, I think, to sort of exert a bit of influence and send out a little bit of a message to the owners. He always denies that he sends out messages to the owners when he does interviews, but it always feels like he does to me. Um, he's always very sort of forthright in his views and he doesn't hold back when he talks about the need to invest and the need to strengthen the squad. And he uses interviews well to do that. And he's done it again there where he says, we need important players and we'll attack the market to sign those who we need. Now, no one will be more frustrated than Mikel Arteta that Declan Rice hasn't signed yet for Arsenal. This is a sign and he wants. He's a player. He wants to put a lot of work into it and he will want him on board as sooner rather than later. He understands Mikel very much and understands how it works. And, um, you know, he won't 
rock the boat and kick up a huge fuss or anything like that. But he will want Declan Rice through the door as soon as possible. And ideally, he would have already had him signed so that on the first day of pre-season, he could go back and Declan Rice could would be there, basically. So there'll be no one more a bit sort of frustrated than him at it. But he will understand why it hasn't happened yet. But he'll still be trying to sort of put that message across to everyone. It's like, all right, I understand what's going on. It's all a negotiation, but we could do with having Declan Rice through the door and these other important players through the door as early as possible. You know, Mikel always was so, was full of belief that the reason Arsenal started last season so well and had that momentum was because of how well pre-season went from last season, how early they got the new signings on, how big of an impact they made, how that allowed them to win games in pre-season, build up ahead of steam, build up momentum, and then go into the new season and um, you know, and and use that momentum to kick off things in the Premier League, and he'll want to do that very, very similar. Now, Arsenal, you know, they're going to come back to preseason very, very soon. Um, I'm trying to think of the date. I mean, it's literally within about a week or so now, and then they'll have their tr- little trip to Germany, and then head out, off to, head off to the United States. So McKellar want everyone on board um, sooner rather than later for that. This is what he had to say about Declan Rice. Well, when I say what he had to say about Declan Rice, what he didn't have to say about Declan Rice, he just said, I can't talk about players who are not at the club. I prefer not to say anything. But interestingly, after that, he was asked about Kai Havertz. And he said this, talent has a price. And at Arsenal, we are always interested in young players with experience. I repeat, I am not talking about players from other clubs. But in the case of Kai, he has already shown a lot um, including the Champions League. He is a talented, versatile player and he is only 24. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. said, I am not talking about players from other clubs, but in the case of Kai, basically I am. But I think the fact that he knows that, you know, this is a deal that is done pretty much. It's been agreed. It's all been going through. So he's confident enough now to actually mention Kai Havertz, to actually talk about him. And I think that says a lot about where this transfer is. And what he said there, I thought was important as well. He said the talent is a versatile player. The fact, again, he flags up the word versatile, which is so, so crucial to Mikel when he's signing these players. And also he said talent has a price. So there he's kind of talking about the price tag. He knows what everyone will be talking about when um, uh, when sort of looking at the price tag of Kai Havertz. He knows that everyone's sort of looking, well, 60 million, is he worth that? But for Mikel, he's looking at that and saying, look, talent has a price. And Kai Havertz is undoubtedly talented. We know that. He's shown that. He hasn't quite hit that full potential while he's been at Chelsea, but he's a hugely talented player. And that's what Arsenal is spending the money on then. It's not so much spending the money on what he's done at Chelsea. It's spending the money on a very talented player who's still very young, who Mikel Arteta clearly believes he can get a lot more out of than what Chelsea did, basically. Um, And yeah, I thought those were interesting comments. And on the PSG links, he said, I can only say I'm happy at Arsenal. I feel loved, valued by the owners, Stan and Josh. And I have a lot to do here at this club. I'm happy and tremendously grateful to be at Arsenal. And we know PSG were sort of sniffing around Mikel Arteta in the summer. But as I said at the time, there was nothing to worry about when it came to Arteta and those PSG links. He's very committed to Arsenal. He's very happy at Arsenal. And um, and yeah, he was never going to make that move to Paris. Uh, OK, lastly, before we get on to your questions, one of my favourite topics of discussion, this man, Emil Smith-Rowe who a lot of you know that I very much like and think he's a fabulous player. and I'm very happy that he's staying at Arsenal this summer and he's showing just what he can do at the moment with England at the under-21s European Championships. Another goal for him yesterday. Brilliant goal as well in England's 2-0 win against Israel. That's two games, two goals for Smith Rowe during the European Championships. He's now joint top scorer at that this early stage, obviously, of the competition, but he's joint top scorer. Um, I thought his goal was great. The first touch around the corner, um, then sort of run the movement to create the space to get the ball back. And then the finish was brilliant from outside of the box. We've seen him do that before at Arsenal. And um, it just, it was a goal that sort of encapsulated perfectly everything that Smith Rowe is good at. It's that really good technique, the first time touch, the movement. It's, he reads the game well and he can finish. He can get into those areas, he can finish. And um, yeah, really happy to see him doing well. That smile on his face in the, the report there, written by Tom Barkley, who's over at the European Championships, works for the Sun, covers the England under 21s. Uh, for them he's been over there he's been speaking to him and just have, you know he's smiling again Smith Rowe he's happy again and that's what you want to see and that's what he wanted from this tournament in the summer he was really happy to go over with England to play and try and build up momentum to take into pre-season he's certainly doing that right now he was asked about after the game if his 
the sort of ambition is to get back in the England squad, the senior England squad, which of course he was in and deservedly in not so long ago when he was playing well for Arsenal before the injuries hampered his progress. And he said, no, not really. My main focus is just to get back into the Arsenal team. And that's what we want to hear from him, Will Smith Rowe. That's got to be his focus now. And, um, you know, he's showing now with England, he's got the ability. I, I'm amazed at how many people seem to have forgotten how good Smith Rowe is and seem to have almost written him off. Think, oh, should, he's not good enough for Arsenal. It's just rubbish. I just don't, I don't get it. He is good enough for Arsenal. He's proven he's good enough for Arsenal. When he was 19, he was proven he was good enough for Arsenal. He came in and made such a huge impact alongside Bakaya Saka. Unfortunately, injuries have sort of hampered that progress and the form of Martinelli has hampered that progress. But he's got so much to give. He's still so young, such a talented footballer. And it, I'm so happy to see him doing uh, what he's doing for England at the moment. Hopefully he can kick on, win that tournament of England and come back and play very, very well. Um, for Arsenal is showing the summer that he has the ability to make a big impact on this season, which I really do think he has. He can play in a few positions. Um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with that Granit Xhaka role yet. We don't know where Kai Havertz being earmarked for yet. But even if he is going to be sort of another potential obstacle for Smith Rowe, I still think he's got a lot, to, lot to bring to his Arsenal team this season. So well done, Emil. Happy for you, and I hope you continue that fabulous form. Okay, now let's head on to your questions to finish today's video. Um, some of these I've chosen because, and I asked in my last video, it doesn't have to just be about transfers for these questions. Send in questions about anything you want to talk about. So I've sort of deliberately chosen some of the ones who have um, who have sort of sent in something a little bit different. And first one here is from Aya Teller. I believe that's the right uh, pronunciation, pronunciation. Apologies if it's not. You said, can you talk about Kroenke wanting Arsenal to be self-profitable and the ramifications of that model moving forward? Um, I think self-sustainable and self-profitable is different, a little bit different. You know, I don't think the Kroenkes believe that Arsenal absolutely have to make money, but they just want to be self-sustainable and they haven't been able to be self-sustainable recently. And that's what they were for. Obviously, they, they made lots of money during the Wenger times, but they had to do that because they were paying off the stadium and all that sort of stuff. Um, and they had bills that they really had to meet. And that's what they were, you know, they were making profit year after year after year after year. I don't think that has to be the case this time. I don't think the Cronkies look at it and think you have to be self-profitable. I think they just look at it and think we need to get back to being self-sustainable. And that means we can kind of fund ourselves so we're not having to find money, borrow money to bankroll these huge outlays every summer which basically has happened like last year was 115 million the year before was 155 million they can't continue to do that this year is going to be potentially around 200 million um that can't continue to happen but the fact arsenal back in champions league this coming season is going to be really help in terms of making it a more self-sustainable model champions league is absolutely crucial to that because of the extra finances it comes brings in but they need to sell better arsenal need to sell better that's where they've let themselves down in recent years they just haven't been able to generate any sort of money from selling players because of the awful squad building that they've done and the position they've put themselves in with high earners on huge money who weren't playing. That's been sorted, or big parts of that has been sorted. And there are players now that they can sell and sell for good money this summer, which was going to help with that as well. So um, I don't think it's going to have any massive ramifications for the model um, in terms of the model for Arsenal moving forward. I just think that's what is just crucial to the club operating as a good business. I think that's the key. It's just operating as a good business. And, you know, Arsenal have been hemorrhaging money for a while now, huge money because of COVID and because of how much money has been invested into bringing new players in. Um, and so I don't think it has to be self-profitable. I just think they want to get back to being more self-sustainable so they can continue to bring in money and reinvest it that way. So thank you very much for your question. Sam Craig now says, hey, Charles, more of a suggestion than a question. Have you thought about doing an Arsenal all-time Premier League 11? I'd be interested to hear your team. Well, I've already done one, actually. It was worth back when I was working with Goal. I did one last year that I did put out on the social channels. You obviously didn't see that. I went back today and had a look at the team that I selected, and it's still the team that I would select right now. So here it is. It was David Seaman in Goal. Then I had Lauren, Adams, Campbell and Ashley Coles. My defence had Vieira and Gilberto as the two central midfielders. I had Ray Parler on the right, Robert Perez on the left, and I had Burkamp and Henri up front. Uh, I had a sub bench there of Lehman, Keown, Freddie, Wrighty and Overmars. I felt so guilty not having Ian Wright in the team. I was like, do you play Henri on the left so you can have Wright and Burkamp up front and get Henri on the team? But then you'd have to leave out Perez, which would be really, really difficult. So I reluctantly had Wrighty on the bench. 
um, and went with Burkamp and Henri up front because I thought Perez had to come in. A lot of you might look at and think Ray Parler, but Parler was brilliant. He's made more Premier League appearances for Arsenal than any other player. He was a crucial player of the 98 double winning team, the 2002 double winning team, played his part in the Invincibles team as well. Um, big game player, always stepped up in finals, delivered top quality performances in really big games. He was such a good player, so underrated. Uh, and he definitely makes my team. Uh, so, yeah, thank you for that, Sam. There's your answer to your question. Uh, London James now says, why hasn't Saliba been announced? Um, well, just frankly, because he's not signed it yet. He's not signed a contract. It's all been agreed. It's just not been signed. He's been on holiday at the moment. And I expect as soon as he comes back from uh, from holiday, he meets up with me, comes back to England. Uh, that will be signed and done and dusted. Uh, it was always the case when it was announced that it was, you know, when we all got the sort of story that it was uh, agreed, it was always, it wasn't signed. It was just agreed and it would be done in the next few weeks once he uh, had his holiday came back. So uh, nothing to worry about with Saliba. I'm sure that will be announced very, very soon once he's back in England and has physically signed the contract. Okay, and lastly, today we've got uh, from Camilo says, hi, Charles, what about the youth academy players? Who do you think will come through this season? I thought there was a rule about having to have an academy player play a certain amount of games or something. It's a shame Patino wasn't an option, especially when our midfield could use him. But who is next in line to form part of the first 11 or at least be bench? I don't think there's a rule um, about having an academy player play a certain amount of games or anything like that. So I don't think that's something else I have to worry about. But um, in terms of who's going to come through, I think it's going to be a struggle this season just because of Arsenal raising, you know, the standards have raised so much. Um, and because of the competitions they're going to be playing in, obviously the Europa League group stages did give Arteta an opportunity, not that he always used it, to change things up and give some of the um, give some of the kids a bit of a run out. I can't see him doing that in the Champions League. I mean, he never really did it in the Europa League, so he's not going to do it in the Champions League. Maybe in the early stages of the Carabao Cup, we might see a few of them. But it's this is a challenge that a lot of the youngsters now face. I spoke about it with Jack Wiltshire during an interview last year. He admitted it's going to be tougher now because Arsenal... You know, when they were basically not very good <laughs> at the start of things, it was easier to bring in the likes of Bakaya Saka and Emil Smith Rowe because the other players weren't performing. Um, now it's difficult because the top players are performing so well, the youngsters are going to find it more difficult to break through. But there are some players that Mikel really, really likes. Kozia Dubry um, is absolutely one of them. Miles Lewis Skelly's another. You know, Linus Souza is a player who's in and around things, potentially as a sort of left back option. Um, obviously Ethan Wanieri we know he came on against Brentford there is the issue about Wanieri's future Chelsea Manchester City very much interested in him whether Arsenal managed to keep him we don't know yet no so I think that probably has to be resolved before he might get a bit of a look in next season but I think certainly Cozy Dubri and Miles Lewis Skelly are two players that Mikel really really likes he uses them a lot in first team training they've been on the bench before um, you know Cozy Dubri especially so um, I'd say those two are probably the closest right now, but it's going to be difficult next season for these players and they're going to have to adjust to that. But, you know, Mikel will use young players if he wants to. Um, and I'd say those two are probably the closest. But thank you very much, Camilo from Australia. Thank you for your question. Appreciate it as always. And thank you for watching and for listening, everyone. Of course, this is now uh, obviously going out on YouTube, but it's also available on podcast and all the uh, podcast platforms. So you can listen to it on Spotify, on Apple, uh, Acast. Uh, everything like that. So please do look out for it. And if you want to listen to it rather than watch it, then you can do right now. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great Monday. Enjoy the start of your week. I'll be back tomorrow for the next edition of Inside Arsenal.